This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Kitson Kelly. Kitson, do you want to say hi? Hello. Now, should I call you Kit? Kitson? Uh, well, Kit, yeah. Uh, Kitson Whatever. is on the business cards and, and <laughs> Kit uh, to everybody else. Right. And uh, you work at SitePen. We had you on episode 277 of JavaScript Jabber talking about Dojo 2. Anything else you kind of want to give us by way of introduction before we get going? Uh, no, that's uh, I'm I'm CTO at SitePen and I've uh, been yeah, working on Dojo 2 for the past couple of years, so. Awesome. And we'll probably dig a little bit more into what that is and people are welcome to go check out the JavaScript Jabber episode as well. Um, as we talk, that episode is from September of 2017, uh, which was a few months ago, but, uh, we're a little bit ahead on my JavaScript story these days. So probably more than a few months old by the time you get it, but yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. So the first question that I typically ask guests on this show is how did you get into programming? Oh, well, I, I was standing in a large, uh, retail, uh, shop, um, stealing uh, Atari 2600 time uh, in the displays, uh, uh, typing away. Um, I, I think my, uh, uh, my, my mom actually uh, was taking some uh, accounting courses, which uh, had mm -hmm. some basics of uh, programming and was bringing home these basic manuals. Uh, and I'd sit there <laughs> and, and uh, eight, nine years old, write down uh, sort of basic programs and, and sneak off to, uh, uh, well, my mom was doing the shopping to, uh, to uh, 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 steal time on a, a 2600 and uh, sit there and uh, type in uh, uh, basic programs and, and uh, hopefully uh, get something working by the time my mom was uh, ready to go. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, and I think my parents finally relented and uh, uh, bought me a TRS-80 Color Computer 3. Uh, Ooh, uh, hot stuff. Yeah, yeah, I had, I think, 6K RAM, and, you know, or 8K yeah. RAM, yep. and we, we we upgraded the, you know, it's like uh, it was a big project with my dad to, to upgrade the thing and, and double the double the amount of memory it had in there. And, yeah. Oh, oh, those were the days. 8K RAM, that was like ripping fast, right? No, well, yeah, well, and and but you still had to because I, I, the uh, uh, the only sort of uh, uh, it was you know cassette tape uh, uh -huh. for loading uh, programs and and uh, the uh, the old cassette recorder motor was inconsistent, so uh, <laughs> uh, my dad had to drill a hole in it and and uh, so that you could adjust the the timing of the motor and you know if you were lucky you got something to to load in about you know donkey kong in a you know about 30 minutes later and and uh, hope the computer wow. didn't crash yeah so uh, either that or you got a computer magazine and sat there for the whole weekend typing it in uh, uh and hoping that um uh that y y you hadn't made any mistakes <laughs> right so so uh I, i'm curious then you know this this sounds like oh it's a neat hobby as a kid H how do you get from there to professional coder well i i i mean i kept you know through school and that sort of thing i, I mean it was it was the the the, the nerds uh kept uh, hanging out together uh mm -hmm. and so you know i made a, a lot of friends got to high school and you know we we especially at the time uh, I was getting to high school, which was in the late eighties, early had graduated in 91. Um, you know, we, we had a 20 gig hard drive that we uh -huh. shared in the computer lab. Right. You know, it's like, wow. You know, and, uh, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona and, and, uh, uh the number of times I left my homework on uh, floppies on my car seat, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh had it 
melted in the sun uh, and and other embarrassing moments. It, 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 but um, you know, we we started to um, uh, you know it, it just kept kept with it, and and um, you know, one thing ended up leading to to another where um, I always kept close to it, though it was never an intention, right? It was it had right. always been bit more of a hobby to me and then I realized that people would actually pay me for my hobby um uh but even even then I, it, it took a long time for for it to become my day job actually right um so yeah do, do you have a computer science degree then or uh well I, I i which is not something i would recommend to a lot of people uh is i you know i by the time i got done with high school i was like oh you know this this pay me uh thing and having money in my pocket and i, I tried to go to you know i couldn't uh, get accepted at a four year university and and so i i thought okay well i'll go to community college and my parents were uh a bit uh, disappointed that that uh, you know this really smart kid uh, <laughs> was only going to community college and but you know, I was, I, and then I, I was working at Radio Shack. Oh, those were the glory days. Oh yeah. Uh, and I, I was like, oh, I'm going to make a career. I'm going to become a Radio Shack manager, and my life is going to be good. And uh, um, and and uh, you know, having money in your pocket and having a car and all those sort of things. I was like, well, this school stuff is not what it's all cracked mm-hmm. up to be. And, and so I, I did about a semester and a half, and and uh, I was trying to get a computer. You know, it was computer science, right. but. You know, doing real things and earning real money was was far more interesting, and and so I I dropped out, <laughs> and um, kept taking odd jobs for a number of years up until the point where um, uh, I ended up uh, working in a tech support call center, an outsourced call center for Apple, um, and uh, uh, that's where I started going down and, and keeping, you know, more aligned to technology. And I got recruited, uh, by a headhunter, um, uh, and moved to Chicago, um, and, uh, started working for a consulting company, uh, where, um, I ended up having, getting far more specialist knowledge in, in sort of computer uh-huh. telephony integration. Um, and, uh, it, w- it wasn't even programming. It was a lot of system design and, uh, system configuration and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, but I, I always kept uh, programming as, as again, as a hobby. Um, uh, and, uh, but it was a lot of hard work, you know, sort of the, the, those first 10 years of where, um, if I had had a degree, I mean, actually I had, uh, they, I had a lot of challenges getting, uh, you know, sort of promotions into more senior roles because I didn't have a degree, uh-huh. right? Any, any degree, even if it wasn't computer science, um, would have unlocked a lot of doors earlier in my career. So um, uh, everything for me was was really, uh, you know, I spent nine years in working my way up in the consulting company where I probably could have done it in half the time. Uh, if I'd had a degree um, and started off uh, right uh, off on the right foot. Yeah, the reason I ask is because a lot of our listeners, they uh, and I get asked by people who are getting into the field now, right? And it's like, do I need that computer science degree? And my answer is generally, well, no. I mean, some companies place a lot of value on it. Some don't. And so, you know, I just kind of like to highlight, okay, look, we've got a successful person who's, you know, he, your CTO at SitePen, you know, you're doing all kinds of interesting things now with Dojo and all of the other things that you guys have going on at SitePen. Um, and you don't have a computer science degree. So, yeah, it might have taken no. you a little bit longer to climb the corporate ladder, so to speak. But, you know, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't preclude you from being able to come into the, the field and do awesome stuff. Yeah. And I think it's only the, it's probably only those first sort of five, six years that you're out there grinding it out. Right. Uh Um, where people are going to go, well, do you have a degree? And then at the, you know, it's like now if anybody were to, you know, if I were to look at any, you know, they're, they're looking at the fact that I've been, you know, doing it for such an extended period of time that that isn't even a question of a degree is, is not a limiter. Um, you know, I I think having 
some sort of secondary education, at least at a little bit, is, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you're in those early jobs. Um, I think good companies don't care what it is as long as you have the right attitude. But in a lot of ways, you know, that that uh, sort of proving that you can stick with something, which I right. couldn't <laughs> when I was 18, 19, um, is, what, is, is what a lot of those uh, companies, you know, are looking for. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if they're going to say, well, unless you have a computer science degree, Degree. I mean, and that's the thing is, is almost everything that they teach you in computer science, you know, almost invariably, those courses are a good four to five years behind yeah. um, where the real world is. Yep. So even if you do have that degree, sort of plan to forget everything that you've learned. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. My brother is going to um, Utah Valley University getting a degree in computer science. And it was so funny because he, he looks at me and he's like, I've really been struggling with my disc- discrete mathematics course. And it's a computer science course. And I looked at him and I said, well, what kinds of things are they covering? And he's like, oh, well, we're writing proofs for algorithms and stuff. And then he looks at me and he's like, he's like, it, they, they make it sound so important. I looked at him and I was like, I was like, well, you know, you're, you're talking about understanding big O and proving that your algorithm fits within a certain, you know, scaling big O. And I was like, they'll ask you that in the interview and then you'll never use it. And, you know, it's just, it was just funny. You know, a lot of the other stuff he's talking about with these proofs, he's like, it's just really hard for me conceptually. And I was like, you know, nobody, nobody's going to ask you about any of that stuff. Yeah. Or, or you're going to, you're going to find out that um, there's some real niche part of what they've covered that's going to be right. hugely important to your specific job but you're never going to cover it in the depth that you need to to, to know you know yeah you know and and so and it's just too hard to predict exactly what that is so i mean the knowing how to learn i think is far more important than yeah. having a canon of knowledge right absolutely and the other thing is is uh you know so you work through all of those exercises and what you really get out of that that's useful is somebody's going to come to you and say this algorithm's faster than that algorithm and here's why and you'll have some intuitive grasp of it because you've banged your head against the wall a whole bunch but yeah like memorizing all the stuff that you have to know to get your get through all your courses i mean a lot of that just really doesn't apply and so it's it's kind of an interesting thing um, I've also talked to a few people and they're like, well, you know, if, if, if you do you look for people with a computer science degree and I'm like, well, you know, if I had somebody with even two years of experience versus a, you know, a green graduate, I'd hire the person with two years of experience. Right. Yeah. And, yep. Exactly. You know, they 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 know the game. I, I st- I'd still have to teach the computer science grad what in the heck he's doing, you know. Yeah, and I, I, I think especially if if you're looking at the web and JavaScript industry, you know, if I, I think it's increasingly becoming the case where if I'm going to chat with somebody who's mm-hmm. just coming out with a degree, and it's like great, you get a degree, um, but I'm going to be asking, you know, what what open source projects have you been contributing to? Um, you know, how you know understanding yeah. that how you know you know how we come up with javascript you know how the standards bodies work you know how how you know the different technologies work you know and having that understanding because that's far more important to being able to uh, be innovative you know it's not even yeah. knowing necessarily this framework or that framework but it's knowing the the, the industry you know yeah. knowing how how to contribute, um, how to work in a team, you know, and if you've been doing sort of standalone solo projects by yourself and you haven't been working with a team of people where you have to justify (laughs) why you think something is the way it needs to be Mm -hmm. and, and you, you don't have that proof uh, of that you can do that, then you're, you're never going to, you know, nobody is an island unto themselves in right. in the world that it is today. You have to work with other people. Um, and that's far more important than, um, than uh, uh, having, you know, knowing whether, uh, you know, a bubble sort is quicker than that. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, all of that said, you know, you get to, you know, maybe four or five years experience versus, you know, two or three years experience and a computer science degree. I mean, now you're really starting to, okay, you know, what, 
what advantage does that give them because they've actually been out in the industry and learned all the lessons we just talked about. And so it's okay. You know, does a computer science grad have something from their degree that gives them an edge over this other person, you know, and then you have all the other things to consider personality and team fit and, you know, how they work and whether or not they know the frameworks or tools that you're using and all that stuff. But yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting conversation. Um, but I think early on, you know, it can help you and it can hurt you and it just depends on where you wind up. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so you, you know, you're out there in the world, you're, you're uh, doing the radio shack and then the consulting stuff. Uh, how did you get to JavaScript? Um, yeah, another sort of interesting, uh, story. Um, I mean, I was, I was working on a consulting project, uh, and um, we we had this it was a really complex system that we were putting in, um, and uh, I had a fair amount of spare time because I was basically employed as an insurance policy if if anything went went wrong, um, uh, and uh, which was fine, uh, but it gave me a, a time to sort of experiment. And we had these uh, giant log files, um, and you know this is before the days of uh, Splunk and all of that back in it was back in two thousand and. Mm -hmm. eight. Um, and, uh, I was like, Oh, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, parse these log files, extract a bunch of information that we needed out of them. Uh, but I needed some way of displaying the information of, of these, uh, analysis of the log files. And I'm like, oh, okay, I want to learn web applications is JavaScript stuff, right? Um, so I was, but, and I'm, I'm not going to make it a thin client application as we used to call them in the, you know, back then. Uh, uh, and, uh, I'm not going to do this Java stuff, you know, and, and right. make it really complex, you know, I want to do it native JavaScript, HTML, I, you know, I'm going to challenge myself. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, I, that's, I started looking at, you know, what, uh, the state of JavaScript in 2008 and trying to figure out how I could create a whole uh, web application, thin client application, you know, using just JavaScript and HTML. Um, and uh, that's what I did. And that's how I started uh, getting involved. Uh, uh, you know, I ended up using Dojo One as the the framework, which is what led me to uh, getting involved in, in, in Dojo as a whole and, um, uh, and understanding uh, a lot more about JavaScript than I ever ever did. So, um, uh, I, previous to that, I you know I had always stuck with uh, I stuck with obscure languages because I didn't actually want to have programming as my day job. I you know because you know, I, I wanted to do architecture, and, right? You know, I, you know all these sort of things. So uh, I always I I, I learned Turbo Pascal in high school and then I did Delphi um, and nobody was really employing Delphi developers a huge amount. There was some, but um, it was, you know, just enough to keep me grounded in programming concepts. And then, you know, the JavaScript, it was sort of accidental um, that uh, actually stumbled upon something. But even in 2008, it wasn't uh, as crazy popular as it is uh, these days. Um, uh, so it was still a bit of an edge niche skill. Um, uh, but then um, uh, what happened was uh, about uh, two years later, I ended up getting an opportunity to go into to management full time. Uh, but uh, it was away from my home. I was my home was in London. The work was up in Scotland. Uh, and, uh, so in the evenings I had nothing better to do than, uh, get involved in the open source communities, um, and started, uh, uh, dealing a lot with JavaScript. Um, and just, I, during the day I was a useless technology manager, um, running departments of, uh, <laughs> uh of, of software engineers. Um, and in the evenings I was, uh, you know, hacking on, uh, on JavaScript. So. Nice. I I'm curious, what was it about JavaScript or Dojo that kept you interested as opposed to, um, you know, you mentioned Delphi and some of these other languages, you know, what made you go? Oh, this is this is where I want to work and live and play now. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I I think in even back in in uh, back in two thousand and eight, it, it, it started to look like um, you know web 
applications uh, were becoming a, a, a thing, right? And everybody, you know, there was the early days of people trying to to strive to build full applications in a in a browser. Um, and uh, but for me, a lot of it was the challenge of of actually working in an open source uh, project. And because I didn't have it as my uh, day job, it, it uh-huh. really became a, a hobby for me. And, you know, it, it, you know, it's like somebody messing around with a Raspberry Pi um, uh, in, in their spare time. Uh, and so um, uh, that, that's really what, and the whole bit of how we develop things in open source, right? That became a really intriguing thing for me, especially because my day job was managing large teams of software engineers, right. um, uh, understanding how uh, teams work and how open source works and, and dealing with those sort of challenges of you've got 20 different opinions, especially when it's open source and you've got all of these different opinions and nobody's necessarily right um, or everybody's right. Right. Um, and how do you navigate that and how do you actually get people who are, um, uh, some are commercially employed, some are doing it for, you know, in their spare time, like I was right. And how do you, how do you deal and motivate those people? And that, that's what kind of became uh, somewhat interesting is in addition to the technical aspects of the fact that it was becoming more and more important every year that we went on. Right. Huh. It's funny because usually there's, I mean, you talked about, you know, the types of problems you could solve and the community. And a lot of times when I ask people, you know, what was it about the technology that you use that brings you in? You know, they'll mention, I mean, it it gets an honorable mention. You know, I really like the community. You know, I felt like the ecosystem was, was healthy, you know, whatever. But usually there's some like thing in the ecosystem, you know, in the technology itself that really grabs people. So I think it's interesting that for you, it was the challenge and the, you know, just the, the opportunity to solve some of these problems. Well, and I, I mean, I think, I think for me too is, is, um, it didn't, it, uh, because of the situation it was in what I was looking at as a hobby that the, the, the you know, what I could do with it was interesting, right? You know, building applications where mm-hmm. I didn't have to install anything. That was the attractive aspect of it to me from solving that that problem, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where, you know, we'd gone from this place where, where you know, everybody, you know, have to install this. And, you know, well, if you're on a Mac, you right. can't use it. And, you know, <laughs> so, so this this sort of, you know, you know, or what version of JVM are you running? And, you know, and, yeah. and this was the thing is, is the browser was just making it possible for mm-hmm. for you to write something that anybody, you know, could use, right? Um, yep. and, and, and that was attractive. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the particular aspects of it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, I, I you know, I, I think even Brendan has, has to do this a lot of times, right? Is, is, you know, the language, especially JavaScript wasn't necessarily in, invented for what it, what it's doing today. Right. right? And we've, we've made a lot of improvements to the language, but, um, you know, if, if we were to throw everything away and start and write something from scratch again, it would, it wouldn't be JavaScript. Right. Um, mm-hmm. but, but. You know, um, it's it's one of it's it's kind of the the thing we have to live with, um, and we can make it better, and we have been making it better, but um, it's it's not the best language in the world. <laughs> no, definitely not. But at the same time, I mean, it it is fun to code in. So, one thing that I'm curious before I get into the the next kind of phase of your career is, uh, you, you know, you mentioned that you know, writing an app where you don't have to install like, you know, major backend systems or, you know, Java or, any, you know, things like that. Um, the web has become much, much more that way where, you know, you can spin up a couple of microservices either in a Docker container or, or on like AWS Lambda or Microsoft uh, Azure Functions or something like that uh, to the point where, I mean, even more. And then you bring in services like uh, Firebase or... Auth0 or, you know, some of these other services that actually handle some of these issues that traditionally would require you to stand up your own back end. And I, I'm not going to pretend that those systems aren't a back end of a sort, I guess. But the, the difference is, is that, yeah, I don't have to go and bang my head against the wall figuring that stuff out. Now, I'm an old Ruby on Rails developer and I kind of like building my own back end, but it, it's, 
it's fascinating to me that now I can write a complete app without ever worrying about what my backend code looks like. Um, you know, well beyond where it was in 2008. Is, is that something that's interesting or exciting to you? Or have you kind of come back around to, you know what? Sometimes you just darn it need a, your own back end that you built yourself. Well, I, I, I mean, I, you know, the, the sort of serverless movement, I think, is something that we're not going to... Um, uh, it's a direction that we're going, you know, yeah. just as much as, as, uh, the, the sort of universality that we've uh, started to head towards in the front end, um, that sort of, you know, the serverless, uh, type of architectures are, are, are going to, to mature and, and become, you know, and that, that sort of, uh, friction that you have of, of, of setting up, uh, these business systems are, are, are going to be, um, uh, a heck of a lot easier. Right. And I think that's only going to continue. And I, yeah, I think it's really exciting. I think the challenge, um, uh, and, and a lot of this was, you know, in, in sort of previous roles too, is, 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 um, uh, especially when you start to, there's a maturity, right? And it, it, what usually happens with these things that I've seen, um, you know, we did it in the browser. I mean, I, I, you know, if you look at sort of IE six and seven and mm -hmm. eight and what, then, you know, and we had Firefox and Chrome and we had this sort of, you know, back in 2008, it was this horrible mess of, uh, potholes and, and, and things. And, and it, it's, we're kind of at the point, um, today with the front end technologies that, you know, we have tools like Babel and TypeScript um, and, uh, you know, other things which are making uh, that uh, a little bit, you, you know, making it easier to adopt things early, right. not have to worry about uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think there's going to be a maturity um, that we go through in the, the sort of serverless bit too, where, um, uh, you know, we have things, especially when you scale in large bits, it's okay, it's great. Yeah, I can, you know, do, uh, you know, a command line, but, you know, when I'm actually doing a real time uh, situation where, you know, I've suddenly gone from 10 users to a million users and 12 months because my app's really popular um, and we don't have haven't solved all those scalability issues and you know and and you know does it become cost effective when you're paying per compute um, and you know how do you how do you measure the effectiveness of that pay per compute um, to right. the point where you're not getting buried in 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 bills because suddenly some uh, Ukrainian uh, hacker has decided to to uh, bit mine uh, your functions <laughs> because you've you've left the back door open and you, right. you've got a you know a million dollar bill from from uh, Amazon or or uh, Microsoft <laughs> because you've been hacked you know these are the sort of uh, I think challenges that we you know there's going to be a mature that we right. have to go through. So it's really exciting, but I don't think we've gotten the maturity that we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting seeing where it's going. And, you know, I go to events and they talk about it. And yeah, I don't think we're quite arrived yet. I think there's still pieces that we, we have to figure out. And a lot of a lot of this is it's functional, it's powerful, and it's a little bit clunky. And so, yeah, I think I think we're going to just work through some of these issues. But eventually, it'll be interesting to see where we wind up as far as, you know, how we start to break down apps and where we decide that we really want to go serverless versus, you know, where we want a traditional backend system on some of these these systems. So uh, moving on to the next question that I have, and that is you're the CTO at SitePen. So how do yep. you go from... Okay, I went, I kind of built this app that was, you know, kind of a serverless app with Dojo One to CTO at SitePen where they're actually building Dojo. Well, and a lot of it was, um, uh, so Dylan uh, is CEO at SitePen and, and was sort of co-founder uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Dojo One um, and uh uh, we we kept in touch. We you know we became friends uh, over that time period, and he kept he kept telling me that I should leave my big corporate uh, job managing uh, large departments of technology people and uh, get my hands dirty um, and uh, be, you know become a hands on uh, uh, CTO for for him. Uh, and he kept 
kept at me for years. Um, and uh, finally, I, I said, OK, fine, uh, I'll do it. Um, and I, I was a little bit apprehensive, you know, because because while I had sort of, you know, contributed in, uh, to that, I, I, you know, I was joining a company where uh, the engineers, you know, were, you know, I'd been doing JavaScript and, and uh, working, you know, with uh, JavaScript frameworks for for extended periods of time. And, you know, what? You know, here, you know, I had never actually been, pay, you know, paid as a day job to to do programming, just pure programming, right? It had always uh-huh. been sort of a, a side uh, hustle <laughs> right. in, in, in everything that I did. So, uh, you know, I was kind of intimidated whether I'd be able to to to, to pull my my weight or not. Um, but uh, all of that sort of uh, uh, extracurricular activity that I had done over the years uh, seemed to pay off and and uh, and especially sort of um, uh, you know I think uh, partly sort of understanding the, the bigger macro problems I mean because almost anything solvable in code right right um, but understanding what problems to solve and at what priority are, are actually the, the sort of challenges that you you really run into um, and and some of the technical details are, are easy you know, to pick up with some of mm-hmm. frustrating, you know, like yep. most of CSS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, you, you can, you can, uh, if you understand how to solve problems and, and that, so I, that's what I, about two years ago, um, I started, uh, I, I took over the project lead for, for Dojo two and, and, uh, uh, and you know, we, it's been a team effort, um, uh, where, um, you know, we've had some really switched on people, um, that have, uh, been, uh, sort of looking at the patterns that, that we've seen out there and, and, you know, cause you know, a lot of it in, and, you know, like we, we talked about, um, um, uh, on the other podcast, um, is, is, you know, it's kind of crazy thinking about writing, a, a, a framework, uh, and, you know, why would we do it? You know, just because Dojo One was kind of uh, a bit niche, but, you know, f- fairly popular back, uh, you know, f- four or five, six years ago. What, right. what makes you think that you can uh, write a framework? And, and we've continued to still have realistic expectations that in a lot of ways, um, part of it is is it helps us understand the problems that we face in working with other uh, other clients right and 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 particularly dealing with those higher order problems that are above uh, the the sort of language right yeah. um, uh, and and there's lots of ways to solve those problems and I, I think we, we see that in the sort of landscape of of uh, frameworks to you know bare vanilla js movement and you know all, all those sort of things and I I mean personally I think there's just a lot of rhetoric uh, uh, in almost all of those things where, you know, it's like React is the best thing. And, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of ended up in this sort of um, uh, intimidation war, I think, uh, to a lot of degrees where, where a lot of people who aren't very familiar are like, oh, wait a minute, you know, am I doing it wrong because I'm using, you know, vanilla <laughs> JS? Or yeah. Am I doing it wrong because I'm not, I'm not I'm using Angular 5 or, or, oh, well, we're actually using Angular JS and, and, you know, is that, is that a bad thing? And, you know, and I think, you know, we've been, we think, with Dojo 2 that we we have taken a lot of the patterns that we like and and tried to um, uh, harden them a bit to make them a bit easier to use by large teams um, and in in ways that uh, we think complement um, uh, uh, you know that large team environment where not right. everybody is a ten-year expert in in uh, uh, web application development right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, uh, but even if at the end of the day, it it doesn't become popular, uh, and you know, uh, that's great. I mean, we've started using it with, we've got several client projects where, uh, we're using it now. Um, uh, and we like building applications with it. I mean, that was one of the big things that we wanted to do was have something that we were comfortable, uh, building. Uh, uh, customer applications with and then hoping that, you know, that maybe other people wanted to do it it too. But um, at the moment we're, we're, we're building applications we're really proud of uh, for our customers, um, which was kind of our main objective uh, with doing what we uh, did. That makes sense. 
I'm curious, like what what part of the process of building something like Dojo or Dojo Two are you the most proud of with you and your team? I think the thing that I'm most proud of is. Uh, I think the first nine months or so we didn't, it was, it was really challenging because we had a lot of client work. And so the rest of the site pen team, uh, weren't available to work on open source. And so right. it was, it was basically me <laughs> uh, for about nine months. Um, and Dylan kept saying, Oh, you know, we'll, we'll get, you know, we're, we're, we're we looked for some more people. Plus, you know, we knew that our, our client work always goes in cycles and you know, that it, uh, we'd, we'd get uh, freed up and, and, and um, I think the the thing that was really challenging uh, to begin with was it was just my ideas, right? Um, and it was, you know, there was very few people that I had an opportunity to talk to. And I, and, and that actually really caused a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of challenges. And it's probably taken uh, partly why it's taken us a lot longer than we had planned, because um, once we got some availability and we, we got a few more uh, people on board, uh, that team dynamic starts to come in where, you know, you're not the only person uh, in, in there. And so I think the thing that I'm really proud of is is, is if you look at the uh, at commit history, right, um, uh -huh. and the contribution history, um, I, you know, I th you, there, there's not any one of us um, that have been working on it that we dominate the 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 code base, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it, it, strangely, it sounds a bit odd, but I and I actually, but I really believe in this is 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 we probably with every major part of Dojo 2, we've probably rewritten it twice or three times at this point, right? Um, right. Because we've learned so much um, by throwing away code, right? Um, and if there was anything that I'm proud of is, is we've thrown away a lot of code. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because uh, on my calendar today, it actually has a code cleanup for a SaaS product that I'm working on. And yeah, that's the plan. I'm going to delete like a ton of crap. <laughs> and And yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, here we go, you know, and and yeah, it is. It's gratifying. It's like, you know what? Um, I solved all these problems, and now all of this other stuff can go away. Yeah, and I, I mean, it, it's. Uh, I I think it's 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 healthy. Um, you know, in retrospect, I would probably plan in more sort of just you know, do a proof of concept, throw it away. Do another proof of concept, throw it away, and yeah. then third time, write it. <laughs> Um, it, it, because it's usually that, that you, you learn so much off the first one and then the second one you're like, oh, I think I know what I'm doing. And it's, uh, it's usually by the third time that you're rewriting an area of functionality that you're like, oh, okay, yeah, now I know what I need to do. Yep. So one other thing that I am wondering, you know, you're, you're in kind of a management role. You're, you're in a management role, you're CTO. So how much time do you spend actually writing code? It sounds like you still get to do a fair bit of that versus doing all of the other stuff that's involved in managing a team or managing the projects and doing all of the other stuff that comes with being in charge of the technical portion of what SitePen does. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, it varies a little bit, but I would say overall, it's a, uh, about 50% of my time is, is uh, directly involved in, in the code, probably 25, 30% of it is cutting code. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, um, you know, the, the remaining 50% is, is, is reviews and, right. And, you know, code reviews and, you know, and talking through problems and, you know, but, you know, directly, you know, solving uh, acute problems. Um, uh, and uh, actually, it's probably a bit, you know, more than 50 percent um, because, uh, uh, you know, we've been trying to, to, to focus on getting it done. Um, but at the same time, uh, sort of being the project lead as well to, uh, you know, sort of prioritization of our backlog and, you know, and all that sort of stuff is stuff that I've had to, um, uh, deal with as well, which is, is, it's the thing I, I like the least about it. Um, uh -huh. but it's probably the thing that, is the most valuable to any particular project is that sort of prioritizing the work and working through the backlog. So, yep. Yep. I totally hear that. We're, we're kind of at the end of the time that I had scheduled for this. I do have a couple more things that I, I typically like to cover on these shows. One of them is just, you know, 
giving you a chance to talk about what you're working on now. If there's anything, uh, we talked a bit about Dojo 2 and SitePen. Do you have any other side projects you want to bring up? Uh, well, there, there, it's a, it's a Dojo 2 uh, project, but uh, it's, I guess I'm proud of it because it's the, uh -huh. it's the thing I get to work on pretty much. Well, it, it, there's another one uh, of the team that are working on it now, um, but um, it was mostly me. Um, so it, it's it's somewhat crazy, but uh, I'll, I'll, it's one of the biggest challenges that we know that we'll have for Dojo 2 is, uh, you know, being able to experience it, uh, especially because it's, you know, it's very much focused on TypeScript. It's uh, uh, really sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, it's for building full web apps, right? So it's a fairly complex uh, uh, thing uh, to do and, uh, you know, trying to make that easy for developers to experience without having to go through sort of a week's long training uh, process. Um, and so uh, I've been working on uh, sort of a in browser editing environment uh, so that you can get sort of live code examples with all the good typescript uh, completion and and right. all of that um and uh, so um uh, that's kind of the big thing that i'm working on and i'll i'll paste the link in there of of a work in progress uh, at the moment um uh, which i'm sure you'll share uh, that's awesome. kind of the big thing and, and I mean, I've been working on development. We know mm -hmm. we're getting to the point where we need that wrap um, in order to uh, do it. So I'm working on a development tool. So it's all the sort of non-core stuff um, I'm getting the time to, to do now to, to try right. to make it um, uh, actually usable. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, the other question I have is um, if people want to follow you on Twitter or see what you're working on, you know, follow you on GitHub. Uh, that kind of stuff. Maybe you have a blog um, or maybe there's a blog for SitePen or Dojo. W where do people go to kind of see what you're thinking about these days? Yeah, so uh, Twitter and GitHub are both uh Kitson K K I T S O N K, um, and uh, Dojo Two is the the landing point is uh, Dojo dot io. Um, uh, there's a blog on there, and then SitePen dot com. Uh, we've got a blog on there as well too. Um, uh, so those are those are the main stopping points. Awesome. And then the last section of the show, and you've been on JavaScript Jabber, so you've experienced this before, but uh, we do picks. So do you have some things you want to shout out about today? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere available from any device uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Yes. Uh, so I, I, partly because I've been used, working on front end UIs uh, for things uh, and needing a fair amount of icons. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Jake Archibald uh, has taken SVG, uh, 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 the SVG uh, command line tool for compressing them. And he if, several months ago made a, uh, um, uh, uh, a GitHub repo um, uh, that allows you to upload your SVG and optimize the heck out of them. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's jakearchibald.github.io uh, slash svgomg. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's super handy uh, for mm -hmm. uh, 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 taking SVGs and reducing their size, um, which, I've, uh, which, is, which is just dead useful, which, of course, uh, the other shout out that uh, I, or other pick that I've got is if you ever need uh, and need to feel inspired uh, for an icon or something like that, um, the Noun Project uh, has uh, every uh, uh, 
yeah. icon that you can think of, the nounproject.com. Um, and uh, it's a relatively small fee that you can pay to uh, get all of the uh, icons available for royalty free. Um, and if you ever feel like you, you like looking for exactly the right uh, sort of uh, uh, icon for something, uh, that is definitely useful. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a few picks uh, myself. Um, the first one is, so I mentioned that I'm working on a SaaS product. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a management platform for podcasts. And it was funny because yesterday I didn't want to stop working. I volunteered to go help my son's scout group with swimming. And uh, I was like, I just, I don't want to put it down. But um, it's just nice when you kind of get that thing working in some way. And uh, anyway, some of the technology that I'm using on that, um, interestingly enough, has just been uh, Ruby on Rails and jQuery. Um, but one of the things that I pulled in that was very, very handy is uh, Admin LTE. And you can find it at adminlte.io, which is just a, a nice uh, layout for admin stuff. And they've got built in, you know, reporting pieces and things like that so that people can get in and you can build a dashboard for them, which is kind of the next stage in that particular product. Um, uh, I'm also just going to shout out about the product. If you are a podcaster and you're looking right now, all it does is manage sponsorships. Um, it has some um, calendar features for planning future episodes, but it's it's pretty basic right now. It's just what's the episode, when does it release, and then the sponsorships for those episodes. But um, you can go check it out at podwrench.com. Um, I'm hoping to update the front page over the next few days so that it actually doesn't look like just a, um, what do you call it? Just a template, you know, but anyway, um, that's what I'm using now to manage all of the sponsorships. It's been really, really nice to move all that stuff over. So, um, anyway, I'm just going to throw that out there as well. And then, um, one last thing that I'm just going to shout out about as far as a lot of the um, serverless stuff goes. We do have an episode coming out. I think it comes out about the same time as this one. Uh, this episode might come out a week or two later. I, I, I need to look at the calendar and I haven't. Um, but we, we talked about uh, serverless with Gareth, Gareth McComsky. Um, he's a guy from South Africa that had a bunch of experience with serverless and it was a really great conversation. So if you're interested in any of that, go check that out, episode out as well. And then also check out the information that we got from um, Microsoft Connect. We've released a few of those episodes on JavaScript Jabber. And a lot of times we wind up talking to them about Azure and what Azure offers. And they offer a lot of serverless stuff. So, you know, um, it's at least worth looking at, even if you're not a Microsoft fan or, um, you know, you're, you're using something else like AWS. It at least gives you some ideas about how they think about arranging a lot of that stuff. So anyway, those are my picks. Kitson, thank you for coming and talking to us. No problem. It was good. Pleasure. All right. Well, I'm going to jump off because I have another one of these interviews in a few minutes and I got to get ready for that. But uh, thanks for all of your contributions and, uh, you know, looking forward to having you on the shows in the future. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.